What's up, everyone? My name is Lauren Wilson. I'm an Arizona School of Ministry student. I will be done with my School of Ministry at the end of 2024. And I had this idea of doing what's called a take 10. And so only 50% of Christians have actually read the New Testament and even less have read the Bible from cover to cover. And so I had this idea of let's read it together. And so I'm just going to set a timer for 10 minutes. I'm going to read from my ESV study Bible. We're going to start with the Gospels, the Gospel of Matthew, which is the first book of the New Testament. And we're just going to see how far we can get in 10 minutes. I'll pause every now and then and I'll put my thoughts out there. I'll read what the authors of the study Bible said, and let's just have a YouTube Bible study together. And before we before we dive in today, though, I, I had a few thoughts on my mind. First off, I am non-denominational, and I do believe that relationship with God. And wherever you're at, whether you even believe in God or not, wherever you're at, in your journey of having a relationship with a divine spirit, whatever you call it, you may not even call it God yet. You might call it the universe. I don't really care, right? Don't take whatever I say as as some sort of truth. I want you to go on this journey on your own. I want you, what my goal is to have constructive conversations to create a space to constructively go after truth with each other to try to maximize human flourishing. Based on my own experiences of life, this is the path that I have come to. And I want to throw that out there. This isn't a space for for judgment. If you're already a perfect person and you have already have all the answers and you believe every single word, whatever that ever means to you and you have your own strict non-open-minded way of thinking good for you this channel's not for you this channel is for those that are open-minded that admit they're not perfect that admit they have questions that admit they struggle with certain aspects of their christian faith or of their faith of their relationship with the divine that is what this channel is about and i don't even want to start arguing but just to throw something out there is literally forty-five thousand different christian denominations let alone all the other religions in the world and i think that it's intellectually lazy to say that there's 100 percent correct one and there is i understand that but to just accept that at blind faith without conversations and what that even means. Once again, 45,000 different Christian denominations. We can't even agree amongst ourselves what it means to have faith in Jesus and to live our earthly lives as Christians and what happens after we die necessarily. We can't even agree amongst ourselves. And so if you want to get on this channel and spew hate and spew judgment, this isn't for you. If you think you have all the answers, this isn't for you. And so I just wanted to start off with that because if you felt attacked, if you felt belittled, if you felt judged, and you can't go to church because of that, because of the way you dress and someone said something, or maybe what you struggle with, the questions you struggle with, or the sin you struggle with, if someone made you feel less than, that's not what Jesus is about. And I believe that Billy Graham was so popular and John Mott was so popular was because they focused on what's actually important, and that's Jesus Christ. It's trying to be like Jesus and knowing we're all going to fall short and we all need forgiveness and we all need repentance but the two greatest commandments are love God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, all your strength, and love your neighbor as though you love yourself. And so it's love at the end of the day. And even that has nuances. Yes, there is guidance in scripture, 
but there's still nuance with with that and hebrews 4 12 says that the scripture is a living two-edged sword right and so as we evolve our relationship with god and the divine is always going to evolve some seasons you're going to have a lot of doubts you're going to wonder if if it's even real anymore you are let's be real anyone that doesn't admit that they struggle with this is lying all right they're lying they have some sort of struggle with it and so again my goal is we're just going to read it together i'm going to read it out loud i'm going to stop say some thoughts and let's attack it in 10 minute chunks and let's have constructive conversations Let's wrestle. Let's ask hard questions because I believe that that will lead to more human flourishing. And whatever conclusions you come to at the end, then that's that's where you're at. And that's fine. And no one should make you feel less than. No one should judge you just because you think a different way. We don't even agree 100% of the time with ourselves. Even Apostle Paul says, why do I do the things that I don't want to do? It's because of the sin that lives in my flesh. And we all intuitively do this, and we all intuitively know this. We'll do something and be like, whoa, was that me? Why did I do that? And so we all fall short of some sort of standard that exists out there. And I don't want to ramble. I've already been going for six minutes and this is supposed to be a take 10. So let me get the timer out. And we're going to go ahead. And we are going to do this thing. As soon as I can get this clock up and going. Of course, it was working. And as soon as the camera comes on, it doesn't want to work anymore. Okay. So here we go, people. Enough of that. We got 10 minutes on the clock. We got the gospel. So the gospel according to Matthew, so the New Testament, the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac and Isaac, the father of Jacob and Jacob, the father of Judah and his brothers and Judah, the father of Perez and Zerah by Tamar and Perez, the father of Hezron and Hezron, the father of Ram, and Ram, the father of Amminadab, and Amminadab, the father of Nashon, and Nashon, the father of Solomon, and Solomon, the father of Boaz by Rahab, and Boaz, the father of Obed by Ruth, and Obed, the father of Jesse, and Jesse, the father of David, the king. And so we're talking about the lineage from Abraham, who was the first patriarch we have Adam and Eve, and then we have Abraham, the patriarch, who God makes the original covenant with that you will be the father of all nations. How does that lead to Jesus? And now we're at King David, which is another important thing to, to point out is that, again, we feel judged in a lot of these situations, but King David the lineage of Jesus, one of God's chosen ones. King David was an adulterer, and he was a murderer. And if you read Psalms, he constantly will cry out to God, God, where are you? Why are you doing this? Why, God, why? But then he catches himself, and he rests in God's goodness, and he rests in God's grace, and he's grateful for life itself, for breath itself, for the fruit of life. And that's kind of the theme and the narrative of the entire Bible is, is God's people. We wrestle with him and we wonder, where are you, God? Where are you in my suffering? Where are you in my pain? Why can't I live up to the standard of holiness that you've set? But you're so good at the same time. And I have so much gratitude, and there's so many things, if I just look out, that are just miraculous. Life itself, breath, friendship, love, moments of awe, a good music, a good song, a moment where I'm completely present and nothing else. 
matters. In those moments, I feel connected to something greater than myself. And King David embodies that. And so it's it's okay. Because probably most of us watching this, you might be a murderer and an adulterer, but King David, right? The lineage of Jesus himself, one of God's chosen favorites. Let's continue on. And David was the father of Solomon by the wife of Uriah. And Solomon, the father of Rehoboam. And Rehoboam, the father of Abijah. And Abijah, the father of Asaph. And Asaph, the father of Jesusophat. And Jesusophat, the father of Joram. And Joram, the father of Uzziah. And Uzziah, the father of Jotham. And Jotham, the father of Hazaz. And Hazaz, the father of Hezekiah. And Hezekiah, the father of Manasseh. And Manasseh, the father of Amos. And Amos, the father of Josea. And Josea, the father of Jeconiah. And his brothers at the time of the de- deportation to Babylon. And after the deportation to Babylon, Jeconiah was the father of Shatil, and Shatil the father of Zer- Zerubbabel, and Zerubbabel the father of Abiad, and Abiad the father of Elakim, and Elakim the father of Azor, and Azor the father of Zadok, and Zadok the father of Akim, and Akim the father of Eliad, and Eliad the father of Elazar, and Elazar the father of Mathan, and Mathan the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Joseph, and husband of Mary, of whom Jesus was born, who is called Christ. So all the generations from Abraham to David were 14 generations. And from David to the deportation to Babylon, 14 generations. And from the deportation to Babylon to the Christ, 14 generations. So we're looking at 14, 28, 42 generations. And, and a couple thoughts here, and then I want to read what the study Bible says. And so we're at Matthew 1 through 17 right now. The printing press wasn't invented until after this time period. And so for a long time, these stories and these genealogies and these historical facts, they were passed down mainly through oral narrative. Yes, there was papyrus and yes, there was paper. But for these genealogies and these historical facts to be passed on orally and to be preserved, a couple thoughts. One, what a miracle. I do believe that the integrity of them, what does that even mean, right? The integrity was maintained. I think that the words themselves maybe have been passed on, right? But what about the meaning? What about the the context? Because a story is a low-resolution picture of a time, especially a historical fact. Right now here, I could pick anything to focus on, the table, the computers, the, 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 the lights. I could pick on any event. There's billions of people on Earth. There's billions of things going on right now. So why do we select the things that we do to preserve as history? What is it about the human condition and the human spirit that we select certain things to pass on? So why did we choose to pass on the genealogy, and what is the significance of the 14 generations? And so what does this say right here? Okay, so right, we're waiting, the context of this is we're waiting for the Messiah. So this hasn't quite happened yet. The Old Testament is is God's old covenant. We have the law, but we're promised a Messiah and we're promised a new covenant. And so for generations, there was false messiahs coming about. So for Jesus to actually be the Messiah, he had to fulfill all of the Old Testament prophecies. And so what this says about the generations, Matthew does not mean all the generations that had lived during those times, but all the included in his list, perhaps for ease of memorization or perhaps for literary or symbolic symmetry, Matthew structures the genealogy to count 14 generations from each major section. According to the Jewish practice of gamatria, the giving of a numeric value to the consonants in a word, David's name would add to D plus V plus D, 
or 4 plus 6 plus 4 equals 14, and David is the 14th name on the list. So right now, even the study Bible is saying there's probably no, they can't really abstract a significance. And so let's go ahead and, and continue on here. The birth of Jesus Christ. Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. For he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but knew her not until she had given birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. And so what this says here is, I'm going to go ahead and read this first. So um, the study Bible, Matthew 1, it says, The name Jesus was given to sons as a symbolic hope for the Lord's anticipated sending of salvation through a Messiah who would purify his people and save them from oppression. But the angel points to a more important theme, to save his people from their sins. Salvation from sins was a repeated promise in the Old Testament. And then 123, Matthew 123, the Greek Parthenos, virgin, corresponds to a Hebrew term, Alma, which is used in the prophecy of Isaiah regarding the virgin birth of the coming Savior. The Hebrew word Alma, virgin or maiden, generally denotes an unmarried woman who is a virgin. The prophecy in Isaiah 7.14 points to God's promise, enduring promise for the line of David. Matthew thus presents the virgin birth of Jesus as God's miraculous fulfillment of this promise in the person of Jesus the Messiah. This brings further affirmation of the promise that God, Emmanuel, will be with his disciples in every age to empower them in their commission to make disciples of all nations, as Jesus reaffirms in the closing words of Matthew's gospel. Behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. And so our 10 minutes is is there, and I just want to end with, with this. One is, what do we think about the Holy Spirit and a virgin birth. There's lots of different ways. Yes, there's the actual God's Holy Spirit made a miracle, and Jesus was born of a virgin. But then there's more of the Jordan Peterson way of of looking at it. What does this mean psychologically? What does this mean historically? What does this mean symbolically? And I want us to think on that, and that's where we'll open up next time just with with my thoughts and then lastly it says to have faith in jesus is how you will be saved and so what does that mean does it mean that the vibrations of the word jesus against my eardrums when this says emmanuel when we know jesus name was yeshua or does it mean that god came into the form of man and died for the sins does it mean Believing in the historicity of that event, that God became man and spilt his blood, and that's what it means. Physically believe that, and I will be saved of my sins and spend eternity in heaven. And then what does that mean from a intensity standpoint, right? Because we all know that faith ebbs and flows. Sometimes it feels strong. Sometimes it feels weak. And then there's the temporal. How long does one have to do that? Is it immediate? And then what are the depths of it? Or is it like the parable of the mustard seed? Where just the tiniest bit of faith will save you. And then what does that mean? Because we're called to follow Jesus and act like Jesus. And so can we separate faith from works 
in it, do you believe what you do or do you believe what you say? Do you believe how you feel in your heart? So what does it even mean to truly have faith in Jesus, in Emmanuel, in Yeshua? And how does that lead to our eternal salvation? And again, I'm on this journey with you. And so I, I leave you with that. And we'll make a couple more of these this week. I hope you enjoyed that. And I, I did. And I look forward to wrestling with God with you guys and wrestling with the truth with you guys. All right. Love you. Bye.